Amen. Good morning, church. This is the time in our service where we look into God's word together. Do you believe this morning that God wants to speak to us through his word? Yeah, me too. So I'm excited about this part of our service together. We're going to be um, jumping into the next, the next stop on our journey through the book of Colossians. And so what have we seen to this point? We've seen Paul's pastoral heart for this church of people that he's never met, just put on display. He's never met them. Nonetheless, he feels so much love for them. He's so excited to hear about what God's doing among them. And he just, he wants more than anything to see these people continue to grow in their faith, to grow into maturity in, in Jesus. And so last week, Morgan shared with us a teaching that centered on Paul's ministry to the Gentiles. And as we looked at Paul's ministry, we were invited to consider what might it look like for us to pick up our ministry to the people around us. And what do we do whenever we meet resistance in that? And he told the story of, of sharing his faith with his friend Devin and how that kind of went <laughs> this way and that way. It was hard sometimes. But that eventually Devin did come to faith in Jesus. And he invited us to ask the question, who, who might your Devin be? Who might that be in your life? So if you missed it, uh, it is online. You can go back and, and check it out. Really good, good teaching. As we shift gears, I want to ask you a question. Have you ever experienced a moment that altered your life? Maybe it was a little disorienting. Could have been a big thing or a, or a less big thing, but nonetheless, it left you asking the question, okay, what now? What now? Could have been something positive, like maybe you found out that you were pregnant. <laughs> okay, what now? Or, or negative, like your, your flight got canceled. What now? How am I going to get home? Today, we're going to be talking about one of the most significant what now moments in our lives as believers as we learn from this teaching, this letter to the Colossian Christians. So the church of Colossae, it was a young church in the sense that these are all new converts. So before their faith in Jesus, they're moving through life according to a different perspective, a different worldview, likely a pagan worldview. Maybe a philosophical framework that had trickled over from Greece or, or some tradition that had been handed down to them by their ancestors. And they're, they're using these things to construct their sense of self, their identity, to interpret events in the world, to figure out who they are and what, what they do. And this, this was how they got through the day until... This guy named Epaphras comes along and he tells them about Jesus. He shares with them the message of the gospel. He presents a different reality. And the Holy Spirit, he works in their hearts. Many of them, they, they're moved. They, they, they believe that this is the truth and they see their own sin and need for a savior and they put their trust in Jesus and they have this powerful conversion experience. They're brought into relationship with God. It's this huge thing. And then they wake up the next morning. And they have to answer the question, what now? <laughs> How, what does this mean for me today? What does it mean for my day-to-day -day life, for my relationships, for the way I think about myself? And so that's the question that Paul helps answer in our passage for today. How do we, how do we carry on from here? Would you pray with me? God, we want to hear from you today. Your word has life in it that it wants to speak to us. It has correction that it wants to lovingly offer us. It has hope that it wants to hold out in front of us. And 
there's stuff that wants to get in the way of that. We acknowledge that. We just ask for your help. We read in your word about being good soil. The seeds of your word would, would go in that bear fruit. And we ask that, that you'd make us good soil today. Where there is hardness, may you soften it. Where there are weeds and thorns, would you clear them away? Where there's anything that seeks to hinder your word bearing fruit in our lives, would you deal with that because you love us? Would you help us just to yield to you to open our hearts and hands and ears and eyes? Amen. All right, so as we consider this, this question, what, what now, what does it look like to carry on from that moment of conversion, to live out our faith? We're gonna dive right into the text. Let's look at verse six. Colossians chapter two, verse six. And there's a lot of foundation packed into this one little sentence fragment. And so we're gonna, we're gonna unearth quite a bit of that together. It says, therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. As you received Christ Jesus, so walk. Right off the bat, we see that the way the Colossians walk forward in Christ is in the same manner that they received him. Well, how did they receive him? For any person to receive Christ, it means that you have to come to a place of recognizing your own sin, your own need, and to humbly receive the gift of grace and salvation in Jesus. That's how we receive him. It comes by humbling yourself before him, acknowledging you could never work off your sin debt and accepting the sacrifice of Jesus on your behalf as a gift. And Paul is helping the new Colossian Christians understand you never move on from that. From that place of humble dependence on him. How do we move forward from the point of our conversion? By humbling ourselves every day and coming to him to receive grace. The Holy Spirit empowerment to live it out, to walk in a new way. Paul's telling them what was started by grace through faith carries on by grace through faith. Amen? It's the same for us. So how do we face the challenges big and small? How do we, how do we carry out our day-to-day -day lives? We recognize our need for him depend on him and receive his grace. Sometimes that grace comes in the form of, of changing our circumstances. That's always our favorite, right? He just takes the, the issue away. Sometimes it comes in the form of him giving us grace to endure something really hard. Sometimes it comes in the form of him changing us. He wanted to change us through it. Maybe we were even the problem. Jesus invites us to position ourselves under the grace waterfall and then just to set up camp there, to make our home there. What else do we see in verse six? It says, therefore, as you receive Jesus Christ, the Lord, so walk in him. We received him as Lord. This is very important. We didn't just receive him as some nice guy that gave us this incredible gift. Gee, thanks, Jesus, you're amazing. You're so generous. You're so kind. Thank you so much. I could never say thank you enough. No, it's not just that. It's we received him as Lord. We submit to his authority, his ways, his judgment on things. We gladly receive not only his grace, but his kingship in our lives. His kingship in our lives. I've heard people say things like, if God didn't want me to do fill in the blank, he wouldn't have made me this way. Or I think God wants me to be happy, so I don't think he cares that I fill in the blank. And these are often arguments people use to build a fence around an area of their lives and say, 
I'm not going to submit this part of me to the lordship of Jesus. I love it too much. So he can be king over here. He can be king over, that's awesome. You have this piece. But in this zone, he's not king. When we receive Jesus Christ as Lord, we don't think we know better than him or have more perspective than him, that, that our modern understanding of things has somehow outgrown him. When we receive him as Lord, we know he's the only one who deserves that job. And this is the final thing I want to highlight from verse 6. Therefore, as you receive Jesus Christ the Lord, so walk in him. In him. This isn't just a conversation about adopting a humble posture to receive grace or, or submitting to the lordship authority of Jesus. It is those things. But it is much more than that. It is about receiving a new identity that whoever you once were, however you once thought of yourself, now you are in Christ. You walk in him. Our actions, reactions, thoughts, and feelings, they flow very naturally from a place of identity. Who am I? Who do I think I am? You might say, well, I'm a vegan, so I don't eat animal products. <laughs> I'm funny, so I crack jokes. Behaviors that flow from identity. But it's thoughts and feelings too. You might say, I'm athletic, so I was confused and hurt when you didn't pick me for your team. Or I'm artistic, so I felt happy when you asked me to design your t-shirt. As Christians, our thoughts, feelings, and behaviors, they ought to flow from a place of identity in Jesus. I'm a Christian, so I direct my thoughts toward things that are pure. I'm a Christian, so I have affection even for people who hate me. I'm a Christian, so I choose to bridle my tongue and speak with grace. You get the picture. What does the scripture tell us happens as we approach life in the way verse 6 describes? Depending on Jesus, submitting to his lordship, remembering who we are in him. Paul tells the Colossians, we become, as verse seven tells us, rooted and built up in him. The deeper our roots go, the steadier and more secure we are. I know we could all use some of that steadiness in our lives. Because chaos wants to show up in our personal lives, in our society, in our nation, in the world. And deep roots, they give us access to a stable source of nourishment. It leads to growth. We're built up. We become established in the faith. And as stuff like that happens, as we eat that fruit, that steadiness, that growth, it naturally leads to the rest of what verse seven says, to thanksgiving, to gratitude, abounding, as we walk in him and start to see what it's producing in our lives. It's just the natural response. Now this way of life, it sounds, it sounds pretty simple, and it is simple, but we know that simple is not the same as easy, and so we're gonna look at some of the reasons why living this way is a challenge. Verse eight, it says, See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world and not according to Christ. So why is it not always easy to live this way? Because, because there are voices out there trying to take us captive, trying to sell us another place that we can source our identity or, or find meaning or get what we want out of life. 
And our human nature is all too ready to buy what they're selling. What are these things? These philosophies, human traditions, elemental spirits, they're counterfeit systems of redemption. Alternate sources of identity. They promise to fix what's wrong with you, give you what you want, and make you who you want to be. And they appeal to our appetites, right? They want to stir in us this sense that there's something missing, something more that we need to really feel fulfilled or complete that is outside of Jesus. As we scroll on our social media, uh, there's just like an endless buffet to choose from. Like, wouldn't, wouldn't you feel more valuable if, if you were this alpha male with 3% body fat? <laughs> Drive a Lamborghini, smoke cigars like me. Look at me. I got it all. When I walk into the room, other guys cower, women fawn. This is the good life. And I can show you how to have it. Or the the Gen Z folks, as I was prepping this message, they were talking to me about manifesting. Look at me, I have the life that I want and I got it through just manifesting it, speaking it out into the universe. I can teach you how to do that. All you gotta know is the law of attraction. Maybe buy some of these rocks that I'm selling. You can have those too, they help. You are this limitless spiritual being and you need to unlock your power. This is who you are and this is how you can have it all. Maybe it appeals to your intellect. Maybe there's a voice that wants to make you feel you know, embarrassed that you subscribe to such outdated religious beliefs. And if you just join the enlightened, evolved, intellectual elite, you'll realize you don't really need that stuff anymore. It is your superior brain and mind that is the key to feeling significant, the key to finding meaning. So all these people, they're just saying, look at me. I've got it. I found it. And I can help you get it too. Like and subscribe. Buy my products. I'll coach you toward the best that life has to offer. Sometimes we're even tempted to find it through our religious works. This is the, this is the sneaky one. And it's part of what the Colossians were dealing with too. What if, what if you built this really awesome resume to prove that you deserve God's love and blessing and, and that makes you feel maybe a little bit better than other people? Maybe it gives you some, some high ground to look down on others from. But it's just like verse eight tells us, it's empty deceit. You can climb all the way to the top of the mountain of whatever it is that you're chasing and when you get there, you find there's nothing there. To put your identity anywhere else besides in Christ is to put it in something that will eventually fail and when it fails, it is devastating. It is disorienting. Star athletes, they face face this a lot. Their whole young lives, they revolve around being good at a sport. They get so much affirmation from it. Socially, other kids at school, being athletic can make you cool a lot of times. They get praise from parents and coaches and it can feel to them like this is the reason why I'm celebrated. I'm good at this thing. It's why I matter. So much time and focus gets spent But eventually it ends. They get injured, they get burnt out, they don't go pro, and they don't know who they are without that thing. There's depression, there's despair. I've seen it in people that I know personally. Michael Phelps went through it very publicly. There are tons of benefits to being involved in sports. I'm not, I'm not coming at sports. But just like anything good, it can, it can go too far. It's not a safe place to hang our sense of who we are. I've dealt with this stuff personally. You know, I thought being musically talented was what made me matter, what made me special. I grew up in this little town where I was a standout and I got a lot of attention for it. 
I was even a standout in college. And then I moved to Nashville, Tennessee, not Illinois. <laughs> I wasn't so much of a standout anymore. And in that season of living there, there were a lot of things that I hung my identity on that God stripped from me. It was crushing. It was destabilizing. I think the Holy Spirit wants to lovingly invite us to consider what are those things for you? They can kind of creep up on you. They can kind of sneak in as, as, as you just sort of notice, consciously or unconsciously, the reasons why people tend to, to affirm you or, or, or pay you compliments or want you around. And you can think if I ever, you start, start to think on the inside of you, like if I ever lost that thing, my life would be over. That's what it feels like. Maybe it's a body image thing or a career success thing or legalistic righteousness thing, I don't know. The next section of our passage addresses the problem at a root level. Verse nine, for in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you have been filled in him who was the head of all rule and authority. That word fullness, it just jumps out to me. The fullness of deity dwells bodily in Jesus, and you have been filled in him. Fullness, in Christ you lack nothing. And this should counter all of those messages that we receive that there's something missing. That's what Paul intended to get across to the Colossians. It's, it's relevant to us as well. And I think this could be a scripture to commit to memory to help us in times where we're tempted this way. Paul continues to remind the Colossians of who they are. In verse 11, he says, In him you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands. By putting off the body of flesh, by the circumcision of Christ. Circumcision is, is an example of one of those religious traditions that the Colossians were they're being told they needed to add if they really wanted to be right with God. It was a mark that the Jewish people had as a part of the covenant made with Abraham. But it was a symbol that pointed to ultimately a reality of the heart. So Paul's reminding these people, hey, you've already received this circumcision of the heart through faith in Jesus. And so to submit to this, this physical thing, as if it adds anything to you, is actually to take power away from the work of Jesus on the cross and assign it to a human act. But I think the circumcision thing was even, even deeper than that. I think circumcision had come to represent that you were in with God. It was an easy way for the Jews to know they were in. And Paul is saying to the Colossians, in Christ you are in because of what he did. You belong. And that brings us to the crescendo of this section of scripture in verses 12 to 15. Having been buried with him in baptism, which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead, and you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. Exclamation point. Paul's reminding them again. This is the enormity of what you have received through faith in Jesus. You have been buried with him in baptism. You have received resurrection life. You are forgiven. Your debt 
has been paid for sins past, present, and future. You are free. That is who you are. This is who you are. And so how does a person who all of these things are true of, how does that person move around in the world? How do they see things? How do they react to adversity? So Paul's taken a moment to make much of what Jesus accomplished for those who believe in him. And it's meant to kind of overwhelm us, I think, with what Christ did for us, who we are in him, hidden in him. So as Paul spells out the spiritual benefits package of receiving Jesus as Lord, and as we're confronted with the magnitude of what, what he accomplished on our behalf, we have to remember, how did we arrive at this place of blessing? How did we get here? We received all of this by grace through faith. Humility and submission, grateful recipients of the gift. What gets in the way of that? Holding on to other stuff as the place that you source your identity or put your trust? I talked about, you know, my season of the Lord stripping multiple places that I source my identity, stripping that away from me. And I've come to see it as one of the most loving things that he's ever done in my life. Because to the extent that he's able to, to peel that stuff off of us, he replaces it with something so much better and stable, never failing. He replaces it with himself, with his affirmation of who we are. And so from that point in my story, the Lord started to slowly but surely just change my life, remake my life. And it looks much different now than I, than I thought it would. And it is so much better. <laughs> you see, like, we, we think we know what we want. We think we even have an idea. We think we have a beat on what's gonna bring fulfillment, but we don't even know. He knows, and that's precisely what he wants to give us. If we'll just let him, if we'll let go. So what now? What does it look like for you today, Christian, to walk in him? to return to that place of receiving grace and lordship and identity from him, to let go of all the counterfeits. As you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. Let me pray for us. God, as I think back on, on that, that season of my life where everything I thought that made me important or, or valuable or special, as you were taking a lot of that stuff away, I remember the pain of that. But I also can see clearly now that that was so necessary in order to, to bring blessing into my life flourishing into my life. And I know as, as I journey with you, as we journey with you, that's the thing that you wanna to continue to reveal to us. Maybe there's stuff that, that was a little deeper, that was hidden a little deeper, buried a little deeper, and you wanna show us, hey, you surrendered to me in a lot of areas. You receive your sense of identity from me in a lot of areas, but this, this thing, it needs to be laid down. I pray that you'd lovingly lead us in that process. That you'd remind us of what we've received in you, who we are in you today. 
that it wouldn't just be a concept that we nod our heads along with, but it would be a reality that we experience, that we feel, that we know in a deep way in our hearts. Amen.